Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you all to our last episode of Human Wildlife Conflict series. And a special welcome to our primary audience who are students from TUT and students from Kenya Wildlife Tourism College. And in the past weeks, we have discussed about human wildlife conflict in regards with, with, with monkeys. And today we'll be talking about something else. And we're very lucky we have two special speakers and our, our first speaker being Toby Otiano. Toby Otiano is someone who has had passion for conservation since he was young. At a very young age, where he couldn't even understand what conservation was, but he could sneak out of school just to watch wild animals. And today, as we're speaking, Toby holds a master's degree in wildlife management and is the director of operations for Awaso Community-led organization in Kenya. Isn't that very interesting? So today, Toby will be sharing with us about the king of the jungle the lion and how we can try not to be its lunch. <laughs> so as Toby will be presenting, please feel free to like your questions in the chats. And at the end, we'll have a question and answer discussion. And then you will also be given permission to ask questions and Toby will answer your questions. Thank you so much. Toby, the floor is yours. <laughs> wow, uh, thank you very much, Sela. Sometimes uh, it's uh, a little bit, I don't know, a little bit unsettling to hear someone talk about you that much. But yeah, thank you very, very much. And uh, thanks for everyone who has joined us this morning. But uh, more so, uh, I just want to also say that in the room, we have one of my colleagues, Matthew, is somewhere and he'll be um, helping towards like answering some of the questions uh during or towards the end of this um presentation today it's just going to be more of like storytelling and also sharing between uh with more of like sharing kind of like story sharing content but i'll start by telling you guys or um sharing about our stories that there were so lions so today we are going to talk about or um i'm going to share with you a story about um, a community-led human lion conflict resolution uh, but first before we get into details of it let's start by uh, giving you uh, i mean telling you where we are we it was is a community is a, a non-profit organization in northern kenya and for those who doesn't know where kenya is uh, the, the, this map on the left can kind of like give you like a reference and uh, to start with the name waso itself we got it from uh, this magnificent river in the heart of Northern Kenya. This is a very, very important river. I mean, in where we work with, it is where we work in, it is the lifeline and the heart of the region for both wildlife, for the communities, and uh, uh, for the livestock. A little bit about uh, lions or a little bit why we, we, we chose to actually focus on lions. I know just like any other species, like all over the world right now, lions also have got like their own share of challenges, their own share of, uh, 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 their own share of challenges, their own share of uh, problems. And to start with in Africa, the entire Africa at the moment, I think we only have about 25,000 lions left in Africa. And out of the 25,000, we have about 2,500 in Kenya. And this is based on the census that we did, uh, that was done in Kenya in 2019. And in the area that we work with, which is like about 4,500 square kilometers, that is like our study area, we have like about 50 to 60 lions. And we all know, just like any other species like in the world, some of the reasons why uh, we have only about twenty five thousand lions left as as is due to like a number of a number of factors like the shrinking of their habitat, uh, more more and more encroachment into their places, uh, and this has actually over time led to 
led to uh, the reduction of their range over time. And we also know that lions are very, very important when it comes to uh, uh, culture, tourism, and ecology, and they're one of the apex predators. And so, in a sense, having lions around is very, very important. But then again, lots and lots of challenges have been facing this particular uh, magnificent, magnificent species. And um, and uh, so so some of uh, and so that is one of the reasons why we actually chose to to focus on this. Um, to tell you a little bit, um, to tell you a little bit about where we are in northern Kenya. This is Samburu. Samburu uh, is one of the places in Kenya that has got like the second after southern part of Kenya that has got the second uh, most important lion populations. This is after Masai Mara and Abuseli on the north. When you come to northern Kenya, it's a, a, a Samburu and um, Samburu and Laikipia combined together has got one of the most important uh, lion populations uh, in Kenya. And the people who are like the communities in Samburu or the communities in northern Kenya are mostly pastoralist. And livestock forms uh, is one of the key things that they do. Livestock is one of the economic activities that they do. And uh, through these over years, over several years ago, through pastoralism, through these communities, is what has kept Samburu, is what has kept northern Kenya what it is today. They being uh, pastoralists, they being Sebinomati uh, nomads, moving from one place to the other with their livestock in search of pasture, is what has kept northern Kenya the way it is. It, what has kept livestock, I mean, wildlife uh, in northern Kenya. But with climate change and everything else, this landscape is really, really changing at a very, very uh, high rate. And uh, as you can see from this photo, this is what the landscape actually looks right now at the moment. Uh, there have been frequent droughts. Uh, I mean, and when it rains, it's like flooding. Uh, there's no cover of thick bush for lions to hide and raise their families. And also the livestock they themselves are are struggling and often there's no grass and lions we we, we like recently kind of con like this phrase that lions also need grass and what we mean by is that uh, by having grass then the herbivores will definitely also have food to eat by herbivores having food to eat then we'll have like lots of impalas lots of uh, warthogs which are like a delicacy to the lions and by that lions will also actually have something something to eat and that is why We've like on this phrase that lions are need grass. Not that the lions have be, have turned to be vegetarians or something like that, but that also by just having enough grass, by having enough vegetation, uh, uh, lion food, which are the herbivores, uh, will also have food, and then at the end of the day, lions will also have food. And in northern Kenya, most of the time, uh, the threats that have been facing lions in northern Kenya has been lack of habitat, lack of wild prey, diseases. Uh, development has also like started coming in. There's also climate change is like actually changing everything. There's also like uh, some of the threats like the invasive species that also like coming in. But since this is like a shared landscape um, with the pastoralists, and also since that uh, there's not much food. More often than not, uh, we get to a point where lions will actually sometimes go and kill the livestock. And since livestock is very, very like important for the pastoralists, that is one of the things that led that leads to conflict. And when basically when lions struggle to find food, most of the times they just end up uh, going after the livestock. Given that this is an fenced landscape, this is a landscape. In Northern Kenya, this is like a, a landscape that is not fenced. It's a landscape that people, livestock, and wildlife actually roam within the same space. And with that, increases the high, high, high chances of lions or any other wild animals running into livestock. But over time, the communities in these particular areas have actually learned how to live with uh, wildlife. I've learned how to live with lions, but because of the changing things, of the new challenges, and of the changing times, it's becoming more and more 
hard for the lions to find food. And when the lions can't find food, they usually end up to the next available thing, which is the livestock. And when they do so, when lions end up like killing livestock, such things usually end up happening. The community will get actually, understandably, they will get angry. This is like your livelihood. This is like your source of income. It's like someone coming and breaking into your bag to uh, getting like all your savings. What will you do? You'll actually, you'll, you'll get angry. So understanding most of the times the community get angry and go after the lands. And when they find the lands, after the lands have like killed their livestock, what was happening is that they will actually go and kill them. So uh, with our project from the very, very beginning was to actually see what was happening to the lions when they move from the very uh, from the protected area, which is not much within the landscape. Uh, where we work, we cover an area of 4,500 square kilometers. And out of the 4,000 square kilometers, protected areas, which are calling it tree, are less than 400 square kilometers. That means like most of the wildlife, and it's the same, same case like in, in Kenya, are actually outside protected areas. Most of the wildlife we have in Kenya are actually living within the community lands. And so in order to address all these challenges that was facing lions, we thought of like uh, involving the people. We thought of uh, um, what can we actually do to actually prevent the conflict or what can we actually do to make the community more tolerant to lions as much as lions sometimes cause, uh, uh, cause Cost loss in terms of going after the uh, after the livestock. What can we actually do? And that was the birth of one of the programs that we have in our salons called the Warrior Watch, uh, Warrior Watch program. And uh, if anyone is familiar about Kenya, we have like two very very important communities. One of them is on the southern part of Kenya called uh, Masai, and the other one is on the northern part of Kenya, mostly uh, called uh, Samburu. And within these two communities, warriors who are the Morans. I mean, Morans are very, very important demographic, demographic within the community. It is their role most of the time to actually be the protectors of their society, be the protectors of their community. So whenever things like livestock, livestock depredation happens, it is them who will actually most of the time go out and find the lion and kill it. And so the question was, how can we involve the warriors? Most of the time it's them. When conflict happens, it's them who go after them lions what can we do and that was the birth of one of our programs warrior watch program which was started in 2010 to address the threat of retaliatory killing and to date we have like about 25 warriors in the, we have like about 25 warriors in this particular program and what do they do or how do they actually uh, help in resolving human wildlife conflict one of the things that happens is this community, because uh, since they like lived with, I mean, with, with, with uh, wildlife for a very long time, they're very, very good in tracking lions. They're very, very good in tracking all the, uh, any other uh, wildlife species. And so what our, what our warriors do is the first thing in the morning, they will go out and uh, find the lions by either like tracking them, trying to figure out where they are, or we also uh, GPS a number of the lions within our, our study area have been um, GPS collared, GPS tagged, so we can actually know where they are. And what do we do with that information after knowing where the lions are by either tracking them by the warrior? So using the GPS collars that we have, then it is the role of our warriors to actually go back to the community and warn them of the presence of lions in particular area. So they will be like, hey. Please don't take your livestock or your cattle, your sheep or goat or something like that to a particular area, because within that particular spot, there are lions. And by doing so, we are actually preventing conflict before it happens, minimizing conflict before it happens, and also actually protecting the lions. Because if the lions at the end of the day ends up killing the livestock, what happens? Uh, high chances of it being killed. So by actually the warriors finding out where the lands are and going back and informing the community, we are actually doing two things. We are saving the livestock from being killed and we're also saving the lions from being uh, killed um, uh, from retali retaliation. Okay? And the other thing that we also do apart from just finding where the lions are and reporting back to the community or warning the community not to take their livestock there, the other thing we also do is actually record 
every single excuse me we record every single incident of of, of conflict and at the end of the day we have um we got like this data and some of the data we have is over time since 2017 to 2013 we've realized that except for 2022 we realized that the number of conflicts has actually been like going up and up and up and so that is one important uh, uh, uh what that is one important data we I'll explain to you in a few minutes why the other thing that we also realized was that most of the uh, uh most of the uh, livestock that has been killed by the lions are like lost livestock and such data is very, very, I mean, it's very, very important uh, for us when we address the issues of livestock uh, as bandry, because that is one of the one, one, also one of the things that we do. We collect this data, then we can also go back to the community and try to have like conversation of some of the things that like we've recorded. For example, most of the, I mean, most of the livestock are being killed when they're lost, and so this gives us like an opportunity to talk to the community, and then we. Through community workshops, through community engagement, you talk with the community and like try to figure out if most of the uh, I mean livestock that have been killed are through uh, are lost. What can we all do together to actually minimize that? Okay. Um, and this also shows uh, this graph here shows what has been happening also uh, in terms of which what what livestock types are like being attacked by the lions. And in the recent years, what we realized, more and more camels are being killed. And the reason for this is like over time, uh, as uh, the Samburus or this pastoralist community where we work, were camels wasn't like their thing. Their thing was more of like uh, uh, cows and goats and sheep. But over time, because of the climate change, yeah. every, single, excuse me, every single person is trying to figure out what can we do better in terms of livestock? And so most of the pastoralists have been uh, more so like leaning towards um, keeping camels rather than cows. Why? Because camels are more hardy. Camels can actually survive better uh, in such areas. Uh, in such areas like Northern Kenya, where it's becoming more and more drier because of because uh, of climate change and everything. Like so, most of the people are like more moving towards keeping camels rather than keeping the cows. But this comes with like its own share of challenge. What has been happening now in the last couple of years is that uh, uh, more and more people, more, more people, more and more people are having camels, but historically, uh, Samburu, this particular community, hasn't, does not have like enough experience to take care of the camels. And so what happens like most of the time, like these camels get lost at night, lands come across them, and kills them. And that's becoming like a new challenge, which again, at the moment, we don't know yet how to address it. But one of the things, one of the other programs that we've started is a camel husbandry practices, more of like trying to engage the community and see what are some of the things that we can collaborate with them, work together, and see how to minimize uh, lions killing camels. Uh, and apart from that, all these things, uh, the other thing that also our warriors do is uh, lion monitoring either through vehicle or by uh, 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 by vehicle. And uh, basically we do this to kind of like know where the lions are, learn about the lions. And by doing so, we are actually able to keep the lions alive and something. Like that. And the way we do lion monitoring is actually identifying every single lion we have. Every single lion we monitor, we know them by name. And one of the things that we do is actually also engage the community naming naming some of these this lions, either through their characteristics. Their, for example, there's a very famous one we call Naramat, which meant that, um, uh, that which meant that it was like a good mother. And so we also, by engaging the community, uh, we are able to kind of like keep, keep that interaction. We are kind of able to at least show the community the other side of the lands that most of the people doesn't know. And our team is very, very good in this. And we, we 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 draw their whiskers because lions probably most of you doesn't know their whisker spots are very very unique just like your fingerprints very very unique to you for lions their whisker spot patterns are very very unique to every single lion and that's what we use to actually identify every single lion in the in, in our study area and so over time since we started like monitoring like lions in these particular areas we've seen like um 
an increase uh, in the trend in the land populations, even though at some some years, like around 2008, uh, they were like uh, uh, like population dips, but in general, we see like a very increasing um, trend in terms of land populations in which, uh, in, in terms of land populations in, in the areas we work. Uh, apart from line monitoring through vehicle, through the strength to identify these lions, the other thing that we also do once in a while uh, is collar lions. And our key reason for collaring is to actually address human wildlife conflict. By collaring these lions, we are able to almost in real time know where the lions are. And by knowing where the lions are, we are able to, again, alert the community of the presence of the lions. And by doing so, we are actually averting the conflict before it happens, saving both the livestock and also the lion uh, themselves. And some of the data from the collaring uh, has actually helped us. This, this, is, uh, this, this photo here shows uh, the number of lions, some of the some of the lions that we've collared within the landscape and their movement within like um, movement and habitat use within the within the landscape. And over time we use like this data to kind of like map some of the key areas for lions. You know? And uh, and one of the surprising thing or one of the beautiful things, if you look at this map, uh, there's the purple, uh, the purple spots, those show like very, very key lion areas uh, within the landscape. And one of the things that we did before we actually even start, we started coloring was actually go back to the community and we did like a participatory kind of like mapping, like trying to figure out where the lions are, where do they, within the landscape, where do they spend like most of their time or something like that. And if you see like the green, if you look at the green lines so, uh, on the map, these were from the community uh, uh, mapping out, just having bring the community asking about the whereabouts of the lands. And later on, when you evaluate this with the lion, with the data from the callers, it comes to like showing like the same same pattern that the community actually uh, 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 gave us like before. And one of the key thing to take here is most of the time we tend to come in and like uh, kind of like have some idea or think that the community does not have anything to when it comes to conservation, when it comes to research, but they do have like some information that are very, very important. And all you need to do is just figure out, tap into that. And this is like a true testament of that by actually our data showing almost exactly the same, same areas that were pointed out by the communities are very, very, as very important for the lion movements within, within the landscape. So we've seen that lion human conflicts incidences have been increasing. We've also seen that, oh, one of the things that also been uh, happening is that since we started, I don't know if you guys can see, but since we started, there's some Sam Samburu and the Buffalo Springs, which are the protected areas. And uh, when we started, uh, most of the lions will come from the park, will go to the community areas. All of these are community areas and what, they mean, what it means, community conservation, what it means that uh, they are like unfenced places, communities and livestock and wildlife are actually living within like this or sharing like the same space. And so what was happening before before we started like doing what we do was that lions will come from the protected areas, go to the community areas, and most of the time they will be shot because of the conflict. Okay. Until we started like, uh, I mean, it seemed like a lot of lions started engaging the communities. That is when things happen. And right now, what we've noticed is like there are more lions outside the protected areas than like in the protected areas. And what that shows is that over time through the work that we've been doing, through a number of things that we're doing, is that um, lions are feeling more safe to be outside protected areas. Okay. And uh, this is uh, and this is something that has, up, has happened over the years. And also one of the other things that has happened is that. Since we started, the number of lions, especially in outside the protected areas, were like less. But right now, more and more lions are outside. Uh, I mean, are in the community space. And uh, so, so just going back, we see that uh, uh, the number of conflict has been increasing. More and more lions are like outside the protected areas. And one of the questions that maybe someone might ask is like, why is that so? 
you see like the conflict is going up. It's not that it's in, in, in reducing. The number of lions is actually like more outside protected areas, but why as the number, why isn't this becoming, why is this not becoming like a problem or something like that? But what has been also happening, what we did was also kind of like evaluate uh, our Warrior Watch program to see or to find out whether it was working or not. And what we realized was that the attitudes of the people within the, um, within areas in which you have the Warrior Watch program was actually more positive towards uh more positive towards Lyon. And uh, we attribute this to our engagement with the community. And so by actually engaging the community through warriors, through other programs that we are, uh, we do, was that uh, the, the attitude, the perception, or the tolerance of Lyons was actually more in areas, for example, in this graph, in areas which is Westgate, in areas that we add uh, the program compared to maybe in this particular graph, which by then we had not started the Water Watch program. And so this basically like shows that one of the reasons, one of the ways in which you can actually address the human uh, wildlife conflict or the lion uh, human conflict is by actually engaging the communities more and more. And by engaging the communities, their tolerance towards uh, lions goes high by, uh, and when that happens, they're going to be more tolerant towards life. I mean, towards lions, and then at the end of the day, we are able we are able to save uh, to have as many lions within the communities as possible. And uh, since community engagement is very very important, the other program that we also um, have that is very very uh, that we also run is called the Lions Kids Camp. And imagine being like in this landscape with like lots of wildlife, lots of lions, lots of carnivores. But the only stories you know about lions and leopards and all the predators is like the bad stories in which like maybe a lion or a leopard will actually sneak out from the bushes and kill your livestock. And so through this particular program, we are trying to change that. We are trying to show the kids, given that there are future conservationists within this landscape, we are trying to change that. We are trying to show them the other positive side of lions. And how do we do this? We do this by doing, um, bring them from where they are and mostly focusing on uh, focusing on both school going kids and none. And those kids who are not going to school, we bring them for a camp within the, like in one place for like about five days in a, or, or a week. And what we do is we engage them through Excuse me, we engage them through games, we engage them through uh, talking to them, we engage them through watching documentaries online, we engage to them and like different things that get kids like excited. And the other thing that we also do is actually take them out for a game drive. And most of the time, these kids like so excited by seeing a line because most of the time, like leaving out when they take their, I mean, um, a, a livestock for either that the small. The livestock, mostly the small ones, because those are like basically reserved for the kids. When they take them out, they never get to see like lion in real time. But through these games, through these uh, game drives, they're able to see lions like up close. And that kind of like get them excited to learn more about lions. And so one of the things that we do is that, but more so the one of the most important thing we do is this game that we created called, I mean, this conservation game that we created. And this particular game, what it does is like, we mimic a scenario in which you as a lion, you are in a landscape where there's uh, 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 there's livestock, you're in a landscape, but like different places, they're like bushes, I mean, like all the different scenarios within the landscape. And then uh, the game is to try put the kids, if you are a lion within such a landscape, how will you survive? And by doing that, we are able to actually um, kind of, get them to start thinking what are some of the things that lions need and how they as kids or they as part of the community can actually help in, 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 in helping the lions like get what they need within the landscape, given that the landscape in which they, I mean, this particular landscape is shared by lions, it's shared by livestock and it's also shared by the people. So by engaging the kids through this particular game is very, very important so that at least they can start to think some of the little things in which they can actually try to do to promote coexistence. 
And uh, just to show you, this is one of the kids. I mean, uh, uh, this is one of the example how such programs are very, very important. Lekasian, he joined for the first time he came for the program was in 2016. And then he had to change his name, come back again in 2017. And then I think he changed his name like three times just to actually get a chance to come back and back and back for this particular, I mean, for this particular, I mean, program. And then that's when we realized, ooh, this guy's like really, really interested in, uh, uh, in, is really, really interested in conserving, really, really interested in doing something about saving lives. And so in 2017, we ended up like inviting him uh, to talk to like a, a huge, we had like a function. So we ended up inviting him to come and talk in front of almost 500 people to talk about conservation. And then what happened when he became a warrior, when he was like, should to become a warrior, what he did is actually um, brought him in. And right now he's heading our Warrior Watch program. Okay. So those are some of the things that we do, but we also have uh, another program called Mama Simba. And what happened here was this particular two women, um, the, the two on the middle, this Muntelium Parasori, what happened is like, after seeing that we had engaged the warriors in land conservation, they kept on coming to our camp and kept on like pestering us, asking that we also want to be involved in conservation because they're seeing what the warriors were actually doing like outside there. They also wanted to be part of it. And so each and every now, each and every day, they will come back and back and say, we also want to be involved. We also, until, until our founder, Giovanni actually gave up and told them, hey, you, you guys figure out what you want to do and like we'll support you. And that was the birth of Mama Simba program. It started like in 2013. And uh, it's a group of women right now, they're about 23 of them. Uh, this is them. And what they do, some of the things that they do is uh, uh, things like lion habitat recovery. One of the things that has been happening is that uh, a new threat which is coming to this landscape is the invasive species. And so one of the things that the women have actually been doing is actually going out and uh, uh, mechanically removing some of the saplings of uh, the invasive species, Inve I mean, of this particular invasive species, which is the Prosuthis juliflora. And it's really becoming like really, really bad within this landscape. You can see on the instant photo, on the instant photo on the far left corner, uh, this is, all that is a bush, all that you see like in green is Madenge, all that you see in green is the Prosopis juliflora, which has actually invaded the entire place. It started small, but right now it keeps on growing and growing. But the the funny thing is that as much as that in a, as much as it is an invasive species, what has been happening is that the lands are also started using this particular habitat for for hiding to the, during the day, and because it's very very thick and no any other livestock or the person can actually there go in. What we've like realized that the lands are using it more and more. So we are kind of right now we are kind of the point. We know it's an invasive species, but at the same time, it's becoming to be like very, very important in terms of lion. And we are at that particular point where like we started asking like question, what are some of the impacts of this particular invasive on the lands? And I think soon we are starting a project particularly to look into that and dig, uh, dig deeper to find out how important this particular, uh, as much as an invasive species, how, how, how very, very, how important it is to the lions. Uh, that aside, the other thing that also the women do uh, is also like tree planting to help with again habitat recovery. You know, like there's climate change, everything is getting drier and drier, more trees. I mean, so we need to do every single thing to try and recover the, the habitat. And one of the things that we're doing is actually uh, doing um, the women actually uh, planting some of the trees. The other thing that's also they do, uh, they have like experimental plots to see how, what are some of the things that can be done to actually regenerate, uh, regenerate the landscape so that we can have grass. Remember at some point we talked about lions, I talked about lions needing grass. Okay, not that they're the herbivores, but by having enough grass within the landscape, uh, what two things will happen? Livestock will actually have food to, 
uh, we lack the, the livestock they themselves will have like enough food, but also the herbivores, which are lion food, which also have enough food. And I know maybe you might be asking yourself, how is this important when it comes to like human wildlife conflict or how is this like related to human wildlife conflict? Is by actually doing that, having like enough grass uh, for the livestock, you have like enough grass for the herbivores. And by doing that, lions will actually have like enough food for them, for they themselves from the wild prey. And by doing that, you actually minimizing the lions going up to the livestock. It's not that it won't happen, but actually minimizing that. So that through this land management program or a lion habitat, habitat recovery, through women like doing all these sorts of the things that they do, like having this uh, 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 plot uh, and planting trees and trying to remove like invasive species, we're actually helping or we're actually contributing to reducing human wildlife conflict. The other thing that also women do, again, um, Northern Kenya is getting drier and drier. Climate change is coming. One of the things that they're also doing when it's during drought is go out and dig wells for the wildlife, not the livestock. And then again, by doing so, what you're doing is actually minimizing the contact between wildlife and livestock. And by doing so, you definitely like reducing conflict in one way or the other. And what do they get in return? One of the things that they get in return is we have uh, literacy, uh, environmental literacy classes for them. So during the day, right now it's three times a week, the women, they times, because most of them have never gone to school. What they end up doing is actually going and doing these classes. And this helps them actually engaging with some of their kids who goes to school. And we've read like stories in which some of the mamas will actually come back and tell us the beautiful stories now through the literacy uh, environmental school that have been able to actually now be in a position to help their kids uh, do their homework, a thing that they could not be able to do like before. I did not been for the literacy school that we set up for them. Also through this Mama Simba program, what has been happening is that we now have like a platform in which the women, the Mama Simba women can actually engage more and more women. And by the way, for those who doesn't understand Kiswahili, Mama Simba means the mother of lions. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't explain that. But yes, uh, Mama Simba means the mother of land. So culturally, within this particular community, wildlife, uh, uh, they believe that wildlife from time back belonged to the women, but livestock belonged to the men. So through this program, what, 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 what has been happening is that uh, giving them the opportunity to check back the control of, I mean, control of, of protecting the wildlife. <clears throat> and um, uh, since through climate change, through frequent droughts, through uh, 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 I mean less and less landscape, I mean less and less space shrinking for both livestock and wildlife, what has been happening like in northern Kenya, or what has been happening like in the past is that more and more contact between livestock and wildlife and people is becoming more and more frequent. For example, in this particular photo, this was what, uh, during one of the dry seasons photos. This is a river, this is supposed to be like a permanent river, but over time, because of all the changes that are happening with this above through climate change, what is happening, this river has been drying more and more than it's supposed to be. And so during drought, what happens is that this particular spot, you can see from this particular photo, like this particular spot, all the livestock will actually come there and try get water, but also uh, wildlife, carnivores, and everything else. Like we'll also try to come and come to the same spot to actually get water. And what that means is that more and more interaction between wildlife and livestock uh, is intensified in maybe in particular areas, and that comes with like its own challenges. One of the things that uh, uh, can lead from certain inter intense interaction is uh, diseases. You know, uh, is like disease coming in because now there's more and more contact when the like resources are scarce, more and more uh, uh, animals and livestock coming to the same same spot. And what are uh, what that's likely to lead to is like emergence of diseases. Uh, this particular photo 
for this particular photo, this wasn't taken in northern Kenya, but this was somewhere, I think, in, uh, in southern, northern Tanzania. And this is a dog actually threatening a lion. And this in this particular photo, guess what happened? This dog was rabid. This dog had rabies, and rabies, we all know that what it does is actually kind of like give, gives like animals this kind of like strange confidence. And these lions actually ended up like attacking this. Uh, this dog ended up attacking the lion because it had rabies. And uh, this is some of the situations that probably also like happening in northern Kenya because of the diseases and also because this is a particular open landscape where like livestock people are like sharing the same landscape, more and more interaction, climate change is actually making everything like harder and harder and making everything worse. And so uh, in such cases, we end up having like situations like this and maybe a dog will get rabid and since this is like a shared space, they probably might end up uh, going, I um, mean, spreading the rabies or spreading the diseases to, to the wildlife. And one of the things that also to note, like within Northern Kenya, dogs are very, very, very important. They play a huge role in livestock management, especially within the Sakumbu community. For you as a pastoralist, you cannot survive without a dog because it's dog who actually help them take care of their livestock, something like that. <clears throat> and so to address this, this challenge, Again, we started another program called Kuras Pride. Kuras Pride, uh, uh, it's named after one of uh, one of the dogs we have in the camp, uh, a dog that has been with us for like a very long time, a dog that is like well taken care of. And uh, uh, the program was started to actually uh, uh, help the community take care of their dogs. Because we know by helping the community take care of their dogs, uh, they are going to have very active dogs that can help um, take good care of their livestock. And with that, what's going to happen is if you have like a very active dog, uh, a very active dog that is going to help you like look after your livestock as a pastoralist, you are somehow in a way also minimizing conflict. Because if you have an active dog, what it does is like whenever there's a predator out, you alert you. And by doing that, you're actually going to prevent the conflict in the sense before, before it happens. So, our domestic animal veterinary unit, we have like a, a trained professional doctor like helping this. One of the, some of the things that we do is actually uh, helping uh, with the community do like dog and cat vaccination. Uh, we also help with uh, treatments, you know, treating the dogs and cats, mostly the dogs, whenever, uh, uh, whenever they have like injuries or sick or something like that. But the other thing that we also like try to do is kind of like dog and cat population control. And uh, this is one of the things that community uh, really, really wanted, but they did not have the means to actually take their dogs to the vets for, uh, for neutering or for spearing. But through this program, we are able to help the community achieve that because we know by having like good healthy population of domestic dogs uh, uh, for livestock, Keeping, then definitely again at the end of the day, um, we're going to reduce conflict in one way or the other. Uh, the other thing that we also do through the program is uh, emergency response to treat domestic animals. So whenever like and again our a wildlife species attack like a livestock through the vet, um, uh, the mobile vet, I mean the domestic vet unit, we are able to respond and help like in treating the community livestock. And we also do like we engage the community to awareness, just talking about the importance of which they know, but also just more talking about the importance of uh, taking care of your dog, some of the things that you need, uh, talking about uh, canine distemper, which is like a very, very uh, important disease, like within this particular area, and also talking about rabies and what you can do to actually minimize that. And now that is very, very important in terms of like keeping your dog vaccinated and something like that. It's also going to apply wildlife on the other end. Um, uh, the other thing that we also do, which again, the warriors do is sometimes trying to help the community with the lost livestock. Because remember from, from the graph I showed that 
most of the livestock that has been predicted upon by the lions are lost livestock. Like, for example, you, you send your kid to go and look after the livestock and then coming back later in the evening, some of them might get lost because these communities to have like lots of, especially sheep, lots and lots of sheep can find like hard of like 500 or like a thousand. So they're like chances in which like during doing that, some of this livestock might uh, actually get lost and that's when they get killed by the livestock. So one of the things that we do is through our warrior team or through our team, other teams, what we do is actually uh, go out and if you find like lost livestock, we kind of like try to find the owners and keep them safe. Uh, compensation. One of one of the things that we get to ask like a lot, or one of the things that um, we've looked into and could not actually be able to do is compensation. Because compensation, most of the times, has been one of the go-to tools, like in helping human wildlife con human wildlife conflict. But for us, as an organization, we looked into it, and at the moment, we realized it involves like a lot of money and it's something that for us would not be sustainable. But on the other side, our government has got a, a, a compensation scheme. And what we've been now doing with the community is actually help them or facilitate them to get to the government offices to uh, get their compensation filled. Because what's happened is like within the landscape, landscape, you might find the next nearest government office where you're supposed to file your compensation after livestock, I mean, your livestock has been attacked by a wild predator is 50 or like 100 kilometers ago and this sometimes and within uh within the incident uh there's you only have like about a maximum of like two days to file the compensation so sometimes like becomes like a little bit tricky for the communities or for the uh for the livestock owners to actually go and file out these compensations and so what we started doing was like actually facilitate the community to get them <laughs> to the government offices to file out their compensation claim. And that is how we try to contribute towards when it comes to compensation. Um, but the other program that we also started doing was uh, we call it bioinfrastructure. But and one of the things that has happened is that Northern Kenya for like a very long time was kind of like not focused on in terms of development and so for a very long time there are no roads like tarmac roads for a very long time there were no much infrastructure development in this particular area but for the last couple of years our government has a vision 2030 and the vision 2030 is actually to open up northern kenya by building we got like this massive project called lapset and basically the idea is to collect uh, a port in lamu which is to Southeastern Kenya uh, uh, and connect to Central Kenya, and then part of it goes all the way to connect Kenya, I mean, uh, to Ethiopia, and then goes all the way to Southern Sudan. And so these are like ambitious projects are you proposed to, within this particular project, we have some uh, development projects are supposed to have, the government supposed to build roads, railway, pipeline, resort cities, and such. And so most, a very long time, this place was neglected, but now the government is focusing on these particular areas to build like this infrastructure. And that is coming with like its own share of challenges. That is also coming as a as a, as a new kind of like threat or like a new challenge when it comes to uh to people and also when it comes to wildlife. And already part of part of the roads have been built, uh has been completed, though some of it um is like still uh in, is still underway and there's plans to actually start building part of it like soon. And through this particular road that has been built, we've seen uh, lots of, lots of uh, a new challenge that a new threat that has been facing the wildlife in this particular area is the wildlife collisions where like vehicles speeding through like this new road which is not really in terms of traffic being knocked out uh, uh, by like speeding vehicles. And so what we started doing was actually trying to engage the road users uh, and in collecting like this data. And we started a project called or a program called Northern Kenya Road Watch. And basically what we do, it's more like a citizen science project. What we do is for the road users frequently using this road is you drive along, you come like a roadkill. 
you stop, take a GPS point and share it through WhatsApp. And uh, by doing so, we've been able to collect like, we've been able to collect like quite a substantial data. And they, these actually as help us, uh, as actually help us like engage the government. I think right now we are in the process of trying to uh, erect some of the countermeasures to reduce like road kills in this particular part of Kenya. Um, what was I going to say? And some of the things that we've seen is that such road seed is not just uh, bad to the wildlife, but also even to the road users, like the vehicles for this particular one. This was after the vehicle actually knocked on a very, very important species of zebra called grave zebra. And this was the damage it caused the car. And so this data we collect, one of the things that we use them to do is actually try to figure out um, uh, uh, like, uh, hotspots for road kills and by figuring out the hotspot for road kills, then through working with like different partners, through working with the um, government agency, you are able to identify these hotspots and maybe something can actually be done in terms of reducing this. But maybe the question that I might pose to all of you, how is this helping with conflict? How this, because I know you're talking about human wildlife conflict. How is like such a pro, I mean, program is helping with the conflict? And I'd be interested to hear what you all think. And so in summary, what I can say is use like this particular, uh, what I can say is use this particular lioness as an example of what is possible through coexistence. We are able to actually involve the more and more community members. We are able to engage them. And through that, as much as uh, there will still be conflict, but we are able to work together and promote uh, tolerance for lions and figure out together with the community, figure out together with everyone, all the stakeholders involved in so what are some of the ways or some of the things we can actually do to prevent conflict before it happens, or what are some of the things that you can actually do to minimize the, uh, uh, the consequences of human wildlife conflict on lions. And with that, I'll stop. Uh, say thank you. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll stop right there and probably just open it up for everyone for questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Toby, for the nice presentation. Uh, it was very interesting. Like for me, it's my first time to see where people and like lions coexist and people I do livestock production. This is very interesting. And but before we go to question and answers, I would like to recognize the presence the presence of Dr. Seoji. I don't know if I pronounced the surname correctly, but the head of Department of Nature and Conservation at TUT. Thank you so much for joining us, Doctor. Uh, so to the questions, there is our first question here from Evaristo Bruder, who says, how do kids benefit from the Lion Kids Club apart from the knowledge? Mm. Toby, do you wanna get that one? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a, that's a good one, thank you. Uh, Matthew, do you understand? If, if like still here, how do kids benefit from Lion Kids Club apart from the knowledge sharing? I don't know if Matthew is still here, but it's uh, it's more like a learning process for both of them. Uh, one of the things this these are the same same kids. Remember, like we 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 are targeting all uh, the, our audience are mostly like school going kids and non school going kids, which we tend to focus on more. This these are the same same kids when when they're back home. Sorry, these are the same same kids, which most of the time what happens is they themselves who also like actually helping look after the cattle. Okay. And one of the benefits, I will say, one of the immediate benefits, and this you can actually see from their faces is immediate from them. One of the things that you can see, you take them for a game drive and you can actually see in their faces because kids, I mean, the beauty of kids, like they don't know how to pretend if they like something, they like something. And so one of the things like you see, you take them for like this particular game drive, they get to see the other side of lions or the other side of wildlife, which they have never been exposed to. 
So that in a sense is like a very, very, ben a bit, I mean, to me, it's like a huge, huge, huge benefit to the kids. They're able to learn the other side of lions. They're able to learn the other stuff about wildlife, which most of the time, as much as they stay, we are like from the same area where lions are plenty of lions and other wildlife, they are not, they haven't been, they haven't known for like a very long time. So by having this, uh, kids come, taking them for game drive, doing like all these games, doing like lectures, showing the movies and something like that, you're able to kind of like show them the other side of the lions. And we believe, and most of the time what we've seen is that when they're going back, these are the same same kids that kind of like actually uh, can influence their parents or uh, uh, their mother, to, their parents to be able to uh, to kind of like be conscious of some of the things that can actually do uh, uh, in terms of conservation. And also not just conservation, but also some of the things they can do to help them and their family save their livestock. Because by uh, being able to do like correct practices, like, you know, for example, uh, not letting your livestock close, you're actually able to not just the knowledge, but also just saving your livelihood which is saving like your livestock from being killed by the lion. So those are some of uh, mm -hmm. some of the benefits, I'll say, yes. Yeah, thank you so much, Toby. And before we go to the next question, there is a comment from Nimi Siraj, the Dr. Nimi Siraj, the head of Department for Nature Conservation. She says, this presentation has been extremely beneficial I would like to thank you, Toby and Sarah, for their efforts. I have sent my comment to Dr. O, who will, be, who will reach out to the team via Dr. via Dr. O on avenues and to extend collaboration. I approved the co-creation of mitigation programs through various methods. I'm particularly impressed by the regressing of plots to help support the ingrates. I unfortunately need to leave to another meeting but thank you once again and best wishes. That's the mm -hmm. message from Nimi. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, so there is a hand from Laura. Laura, you can go ahead, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. No, thank you so much, Toby, for the presentation. Unfortunately, I couldn't join from the beginning, but uh, I missed it, but I will see the recordings. Okay. Uh, so I'm very interested to know, interested to know the collecting data uh, system, the platform that you showed. <laughs> mm. How does it How does it work? Who manages it? Who collects the data? Is it a WhatsApp or how exactly the details? I'm very interested to know. For my that's my first question, yeah, and the yeah. second question is about the relief fund. Uh, the relief part, I mean, the compensation stuff. I mean, yeah, the compensation because uh, I work well. Sorry, my name is Laura and I work for for a development uh, NGO in Zimbabwe. Right. Right. And Zimbabwe just uh, released a, a, a bill. Right. Uh, and for the first time, uh, there's going to be a relief fund uh, for big victims of uh, human wildlife conflicts. Right. And it's still uh, and. Well, uh, the implementation hasn't started. It's only le the legislation. And I would like to know uh, more about the Kenyan, uh, the Kenyan experience and who gets the funding. Is it how, how who is involved? Is it the police doing the assessments or is it uh, the equivalent to national parks? And right. uh, where does the money come from for the fund? For the fund yeah. right now in Zimbabwe is is a, le a levy from, for instance, hunting activities and so on. But I, I really would like to know the experience in Kenya. That was my second question. Thank you. Okay, so maybe to start with, and um, uh, my colleague here will actually help uh, me, me clarify some of it. Uh, but uh, by data, you meant uh, the roadkill data, right? Yes, correct. Okay, so that is uh, a program that we started with one of our partners called Brave Zebra Trust. We were like actually neighbors working in the same kind of like the same the same landscape, but more focusing on Grave Zebra Trust. I mean, Grave Zebra. I don't know if any of you know the Grave Zebra is like very endangered and only found in northern Kenya. And 
uh, southern part of Ethiopia. So this particular program, uh, it's I mean the data itself is housed by Waso Lands and Living Weber Trust, and uh, the data the way we like doing it's actually just getting the people sending in their data through WhatsApp because nowadays almost every single person is on WhatsApp, and so that was like the easiest way to actually capture this data. Uh, we kind of like trying to move away from WhatsApp. Uh, but trying to figure out how do we bring in like a new data collection app. Uh, but then again, we haven't quite figured out uh, exactly how to do that. But one of the things that we started using was survey one, two, three. But most of the time still, what we do is get the data through WhatsApp and kind of like get it one of one of our, one of our clicks will actually get it from the WhatsApp and then like uh, upload it on survey one, two, three, so that at least you can actually get use that to 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 get like some analysis done or something like that. So yes, the data is in both the organizations, so Waso Lions and Green Zebra Trust, and uh, yeah, it's a collaborating thing. So once in a while, we get to go and, uh, and like feedback to to the same same uh, the same same person, so to the same group that has been helping here collecting. Hope that answers your question. And in terms of compensation, the compensation we have right now is done by the government and the funds are all coming from the government. And it's uh, all managed by Kenya Wildlife Service. Kenya Wildlife Service is this government entity that is like uh, mandated to take care of like all the wildlife. You know, so all the funds are being managed by them. When they do it all, like all the processes like being, um, I mean, managed by them. And for us, all we have to do, because we are a non-government organization, all we have to do is kind of like help the community to get them to the government offices, because the government offices are not everywhere. So what we do is more of like facilitating the community to help them file up like this compensation form. Which unfortunately, again, since we started doing this, none has actually been paid which again brings in like another for us that's like brings in like another challenge mm. and we just still don't know how to do or what to do about it yes thank you so much toby lola i hope he has answered all your questions yes uh, he did unfortunately we are in the same situation in in Zimbabwe, where still yeah. implementation of the relief fund and how to canalize the money and so on. So, yeah, well. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you so goes. much. Thank you. Thank you for the questions, Lola. Now we should move on to the student at TUT. Hello. My name is Zander Barkazin. I'm a second year student at uh, TUT for studying nature conservation. I have two questions. Is it your... Yeah. Traditional Chinese medicine, does it have an influence, influence on the line bone train, trade in Kenya? And do you have cases of uh, rabies with lions, at, with the dogs? Oh, great. Yeah, those are like really good questions. Um, yes, to start with the bone, I mean, the bone thing, there was like a time that we thought it was going to be like a challenge, especially in Northern Kenya. But fortunate enough, it never got to where we are. Uh, and even if it has been, we haven't actually, uh, I mean, had over like recorded like any case in which that lion killing or something was directly related to lion, I mean, bone trade in China or something like that. And so fortunate enough, that's not been the case in Kenya, especially in Northern Kenya, that has been actually recorded of known of. When it comes to what was the second question again? Sorry. Uh, the second question is: uh, Do you have any cases of rabies with oh, the yes. lions? For the lions, the only one that was like documented was that photo I showed. But that was like actually more of like in 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 in, in um in Tanzania because that particular photo was taken in Tanzania. Uh where we work, the only cases that we've recorded or like we've known of. Is not rabies in lions. You're not saying that it might not be, because again, when it comes to wild animals, you never know, because we are not allowed or like in some our interaction, like direct interaction with any wildlife is kind of like limited, especially in Kenya. 
all we do, we, we are not allowed by the government to actually go and like put a land run, except through the explicit permission, which most of the time the closest we're going to is get, getting permission to uh to do what? Getting permission to put on the collars. And so for lions in particular, we haven't had any cases of not that we haven't recorded any cases of rabies in them, but what we've known was the outbreak of Canandit's temper, which this is what like before we started this particular program, Kura Sprite, uh, there was an outbreak of Canaan distemper, and this almost wiped all the wild dogs within the area in which you work. And this was this actually we found like dead wild dogs. We took samples, we brought in the government, I mean, took the samples to the vet, and it was confirmed outbreak of canine distemper. Uh, but the assumption is if there is canine distemper in wild dogs, then there's the high chances that there will have been canine distemper in wild dogs. But then again, when it comes to wild uh, predators, you can't actually go out and start vaccinating them. But by actually vaccinating the uh, domestic dogs, with like around within like the same landscape, you are able to kind of like reduce the viral load and hopefully it doesn't get to the, to the lions and other wildlife. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> no. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ernest Molepula, from, also from the TUT University. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Tui, for the wonderful for the wonderful presentation. Hopefully, it will help us a lot. Okay. So, sir, uh, I, I have only one simple question for you. I'm interested in knowing how, how the warriors go about protecting themselves in the bush while they are trying to protect the uh, the the community. If ever they they get in contact with me with the with the pride of a lion, how do they go yeah. about protecting themselves? Since well I saw in the picture they don't have any weapons. They right. don't carry any weapons. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's a very good question. Um, uh, Sela, will you mind unmuting Matthew? I think he's like trying to, I mean, help like answer some of these questions. And yeah, that's yeah, a very, I'm... very, yeah, that's a very important question. Matthew, do you want to go first? Mm -hmm. oh, he's gone again. But yes, how do the community or how do the warriors protect themselves uh, against the lands? One of the things is by living with wildlife for a very long time, you're definitely going to learn skills or like learn techniques in which to put like yourself in danger. Lions are like still very dangerous, especially if if they get cornered or something like that. But now what has happened, one of the things, one of the defense mechanisms by the world is that uh, they know their landscape very well. They know the behaviors of the lands very well. So whatever they do most of the time, they'll tend to uh, know where to do, how to follow the lands or how close to actually get to them. So that is how one of the ways in which like they protect themselves. And when they're like tracking the lands, we don't, on foot especially, they don't actually go uh, that very close. You gotta know like what's the closest you can get to a land because you gotta protect yourself. So through their skills, they know like the closest they can get near a lion. So as to like protect them, or they know if a lion goes this way, like they know like all kinds of behaviors, and by actually understanding and know what kinds of behaviors of lions, they're able to protect themselves and not being attacked. And uh, if we need to get closer, for example, we need to get closer in terms of like taking photos for IDing the lions, what they do in that in those particular cases, we then uh, use a vehicle, use like a car to get like very up close thing. And guns sometimes, if we need to, legally in Kenya, I mean, gun ownership is like a little bit different. Uh, but in this particular part of Kenya, pastoralists also have guns illegally, but they do have guns to protect themselves. Uh, mostly not from, actually not from the wildlife, but to protect themselves uh, from bad entry because in Northern Kenya that sometimes happens where like a diff another community will come to your community and like steal all your livestock. So the community mm -hmm. themselves have got guns to protect themselves, not from the lions, but more from, from the other, from the other persons. Matthew, Hello everyone. I'm Matthew. 
Uh, I think to be uh, you've mentioned almost everything. Um, um, mostly, I think you just mentioned everything about it. Maybe I'll answer the second question or the other questions. Okay. For now. Thanks. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sawelo Kolen Matlamo from also from TBT. My main question is that uh, I heard you mentioning that the loss of livestock is a, also a major problem in terms of uh, human wildlife conflicts. Yeah. Are there any compensation schemes that are willing to fund the farmers who are losing their livestock or the locals of the communities? Uh, from us in particular, from our organization, uh, we don't have any compensation program. But other parts of Kenya, we've heard, like especially Southern Kenya, there's another organization, there's another organization that has actually been working with the community to do like a, a compensation, to start like a competition program. But for us in Northern Kenya, especially for lions, we don't have any at the moment. The only one we have is the one that is managed and run by the government. You know, and what we do, what we do as an organization, in that particular one, what we do is more of uh, facilitate the community to go and file out their compensation, uh, compensation uh, uh, schemes. What? <clears throat> um, sure. Um, we actually do not have any compensation for livestock lost. Uh, the, the the uh, the government co compensation, the one that uh, Tobias talked about, and which mostly it's all about um. Uh, compensating for the livestock lost and uh, it usually takes time for before the herders or the livestock owners are completely paid or something like that yeah so that's that's what you usually have uh good morning uh my name is Mpuno Masang from TUT I'm also a student from TUT doing nature conservation as well so my question uh is that uh what the, can you say are the main causes of uh human uh, lion human conflict and uh what are your biggest challenges when dealing with uh the human lion human conflict? Uh, Matt, thank you, thank you, uh, Matt. Yeah, yeah, okay. So um, um, one of the challenges that we have dealing with human wildlife conflict is uh the fact that uh. Uh, the community within where we work from are mostly uh, pastoralists or nomadic pastoralists. So you find at times um, they migrate a lot in search of uh, pastures and all that. And most of the time when they migrate, you can't con you can't like have these uh, predator-proof bombers where you can uh, where you can uh, uh, assist them with uh, protecting themselves from uh, conflict. And uh, also they graze a lot and they move around a lot of the livestock. In the in the process of moving around, they uh they come into, uh, they usually come uh where the lions are. It's so hard again to uh prevent uh, uh as in try to prevent the conflicts. Yep, maybe ask the first question. I didn't get it well. Um. Good morning. Good morning. Yep. How are you? Good, very good. I'm also, I'm also good. My name is um Spele Lotwala. Um, I wanted to ask a question on, um, in terms of like lion collars. Mm -hmm. How do you like decide um which uh lion in like the pride do I put a color on? And uh, at what age do you maybe like start putting collars? Do you start when they're like adults, or you can also maybe put a collar on like cubs? And uh. Is it best to also uh put the colors on like the female lions or is it best to put them on male lions? How does it work in terms of like deciding how do I put my colors on lions? Hmm. Thank you yes. for the question. What do you want to take this first? Yeah. So um <clears throat> I'll start by mentioning that uh we have four prides of lions where we are, and most of these prides, like two of them are found in the community land. And uh, the other ones are within the reserves. So we usually make the decision of coloring by the movement or uh, by where these prides are at the moment. So uh, 
for instance, like uh, the recent coloring that we've done, we've chosen lounges which are in the community, and we colored one which is the uh, which is the the the, the, uh, the eldest uh, lion, and which leads the other pride uh, the other lounge. And then we also colored another one in a community land, and also one in an area where they co-share the parks. That is the move from the, the two different parks that we, we work with. So uh, we color both males and females, and we choose uh, the eldest or the one that leads the pride, and that's how we make the decision. Uh, for the small lions, or for the young lions, we hardly color them because we need uh, they, they, they haven't yet taken any lead or any roles in the pride. So we usually mm -hmm. avoid them and uh, take the all the, the elders that are move around and lead the other uh, the other lands. Yep. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, just to add, uh, in terms of age, we only call our, <clears throat> excuse me, we only call our lions that are four years old and not less. So any lion that is less than four years old, we don't. And the reason okay. is like, if you put like a collar, this is like a fixed thing. If you put like a collar on like a, a, a young lion, that has uh, a young lion, there's a possibility that they might outgrow the collar and that might actually choke them. So when collaring, specifically we target uh, older lions, which are four years and above. Because by four years, we believe that, uh, uh, by four years, it's been shown that they won't grow that much. They might grow fatter and thinner, but... Uh, they've like they're adults, and so there's possibility that they want to grow more than that. So target for four years old lions are not any younger lions than that. Also, the other thing that we why you maybe just to add on what what you just said. The other thing that the other reason why we target males, males specifically to see their movement because males tend to uh they will be born. They tend to get at another age. Then most of the time they tend to leave the pride and go look for like their own families or something like that. So <clears throat> one of the reasons sometimes when we call the males just see the movement between prides. When like we call them apart from the conflict, will they actually move from their pride? And when they move and they leave their pride, where do they go? But sometimes, or sometimes, especially the males, uh, they disappear. After getting older, they leave their prides and actually disappear. So the other reason, what <clears throat> the other thing that these callers help us like figure out when they move their maternal prides, where do they go? And by that, we are able to map out how they use the landscape. So yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, We'd also like to thank uh, Sheskrin Africa and you, Toby. Your presentation was very nah. I think it's going to help us a lot in uh the assignments that we're doing and also some of our tests, they very much talk about uh, human wildlife conflict. Thank you. Sure. It's our pleasure. It's our pleasure, both me and Mati. Yeah, so there's a more than welcome. And Toby from our side, thank you, thank you for putting all this effort into a talk. Uh, my sure. students really do appreciate it. And yes, they are going to be tested on this. And sure. the students that have missed this session this morning are getting minus 20 in the next test. So <laughs> they're in big trouble. <laughs> because even that they missed it, they're getting minus 20 and they won't know what to write about anyway. But yeah. thank you, Toby, for going the extra mile for us. I appreciate it. And it's making a difference. And I can see you are very passionate. And please keep that up. Never thank lose that, that spark. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all and thanks very much, Matthew, for actually, I mean, you're like in different parts of the world, but yeah, thanks, Matthew, for finding time to join us for this. Thank you, Sal, and thanks for everyone, Marit and everyone, for giving us like this particular opportunity to come in here. Thank you so much, Toby, and thank you so much, Mark, for your time, for your good presentation. We have really enjoyed it.